Okay, but now we are delayed. Um, anyway, so, um, so our next session is about applications and programming. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Oleg. Um, you may know me from features like PyTerm or uh, Auto in it. And uh, I have the pleasure to introduce our first speaker, which is very well aligned uh, with our last breakout session on Rust, because uh, Tame is uh, uh, not only a software developer, but was also a, a Rust trainer. And um, I'm particularly excited to, um, to finally have some um, topics on time synchronization um, because, from my perspective, that's a feature that is still um, pretty much missing in, in Riot. So we have basic time synchronization, but going more in this direction would be would be awesome. So um, please welcome our first speaker, and the stage is yours. Yes. Yeah, thank you. It works? Oh, OK. Nice. Hi. Uh, what? Let's start here. Uh, I'm Tamer. We're slightly delayed. That happens in time. Like, it's fine. Um, I'm a software developer at a software consultant in the Netherlands called Tweedegolf, or you might also name, uh, know it under the name of Tweedgolf or Tweedegolf, or it uh, invites to mispronunciation. Um, where we develop software and firmware in mainly Rust, sometimes in other languages, because we want to talk to other languages, so we do some interoperative stuff there, um, sometimes investigate there. Um, and I also give Rust training. So, for example, last Embedded World conference, uh, we gave a training on like how to get started with embedded Rust. Um, why am I here for time synchronization? I also worked on NTP DRS which is a modern implementation of the network time protocol in Rust. And I also worked on stat time, which is a modern implementation of the decision time protocol in Rust. Um, what we're going to talk about today is basically the applications of time synchronization, so meaning basically why would you want to synchronize time and where would you like to do it. Um, some methods, basically how do you synchronize time between devices if you need to. And then we're going to have a look at NTPD or at NTP, the network time protocol, together with NTS, the network time security protocol, and at PTP, the precision time protocol. Um, so, why would you like to synchronize your clocks? Um, there's a really wide range of like stuff where you need that, starting from like TLS certificates, where it's like really, really nice to know if that certificate is really still uh, valid or not, especially after Heartbleed, so please don't accept certificates that were issued before Heartbleed. Um, where it's actually, it's pretty fine if the clock is in within a few minutes, like, sure, somebody could get the certificate uh, right before it expires and then use that, but actually it's fine if it's like within a few minutes, uh, your clock can still say like, okay, this certificate is valid or this is not. Um, some appliances, which is a particular pain point for me, is oven clocks. So if you go into a kitchen and you have an oven and a microwave and there's two clocks and they're like just slightly out of the sink all the time. So please, please, think if whenever you build an IoT microwave or uh, oven, please, please synchronize their clocks well so they just flip over at the same moment. Uh, but that's mostly a convenience, like it's, it's fine. Also another application that falls within the, like you want to be within a few seconds is TOTP tokens, so time-based one-time passwords. Uh, that's usually where people like figure out their NTP daemon isn't actually running anymore because suddenly I can't log into the website anymore because the server's NTP server uh, died a few months ago and now the clock drifted away out of the usually like one minute window. So uh, that's a nice hassle for you. Um, and if you go down further, like you want actually your clock to be uh, synchronized nicer, it's like in the milliseconds range when you have like two machines, you get the log files from two machines and you want to compare what happened first. Then usually it's fine if it's within a few milliseconds, except for if you have really time, uh, time critical applications where you want to go down further. Um, there's also more crazy applications, uh, or crazy, more technical applications where you actually need precise time. So, for example, there's differential line protection, 
That's basically how you protect big power lines from failures. You just measure on both sides how much energy goes in, how much energy comes out of it, and if those two numbers disagree, then you know that something somewhere along your line there's somewhere a failure, and you better shut that thing down because otherwise stuff breaks. Um, there you need to go down to about one microsecond of accuracy, so you actually know like okay where where in the phase did that happen? Um, 5G is they, they want you to synchronize your cell towers to within 100 nanoseconds because there they want to make sure if two cell towers want to transmit in the same direction at the same time, only one of them transmits and then right after the other one transmits. And if you really want to use all of the bandwidth and all of the time, you really want to make sure like, okay, A sends at exactly one second and B sends at one second plus 500 nanoseconds after the first frame is just through. Um, so they want 100 nanoseconds. Uh, I heard rumors of uh, people that actually 100 nanoseconds is the best thing some uh, manufacturer can deliver and that's why that's in the spec now. But those are just rumors. I, I don't want to reproduce those. Uh, if you operate a particle accelerator in your backyard or in Switzerland, then you want to go down lower to below one nanosecond. So you can actually make sure if your particle traveled with more than light speed or not. Um, and in that, those cases, it's actually quite interesting that if you don't plug in your fiber cable all the way, then suddenly your timing changes. So uh, yeah. Um, how do we do this now? Like we want a well synchronized clock, be it for TLS certificates or be it for our science experiment. Um, there's a few different methods. Most common if you want precise time is GNSS, so global navigation satellite systems, uh, also known as GPS, GLONASS, Baidu, or uh, Galileo. Um, those are really nice because they basically send for you some atomic clocks up to space and there they like, keep, keep time pretty perfectly and so uh, you can take time from there. Uh, if you want to have an appliance which uses less power and is smaller and you really don't want to invest 10 euros in a GPS receiver, uh, then go for radio uh, receivers. In Europe that's DCF 77 operated from Germany. Um, or the British also have their own time sinks or time ser uh, sender as well as uh, the U US has one and I think China has two now. Um, so those are pretty nice because you just need a ferrite rod antenna and a bit of analog circuitry to decode the signal but it's pretty okay. Like you get in a few milliseconds usually or if you want to invest a bit more and buy a appliance which does fancy analog stuff, uh, then you can get down to like 20 microseconds accuracy. Uh, usually we already have like a communications channel, we want to reuse that, so we want to use the network in some way and this is basically what this talk is going to be about. Uh, so just reuse the channel we already have, why have another radio? Um, so because there's a, such a wide range of stuff you want to do and uh, applications you have, there's also quite a few different protocols. There's NTP, uh, the network time protocol which has been around since the 80s and is pretty widely uh, applied. Uh, there's PTP, the precision time protocol which is uh, more precise <laughs> as the name suggests in the way that it also uses some extra tricks to get more uh, precision out of it. There's also currently an IETF draft for a protocol called rough time. Uh, that one is uh, the idea there is you have a freshly new machine and you want to connect to some time server and now check what the time it is but you also don't trust anybody around you. So they hard code a set of um, ED25519 keys and can verify with that a few servers. They even do some nice tricks where they can uh, chain the packets in a way that they can later can prove like this server over there was malicious to me and told me the wrong time. Please put him on the uh, revocation list. Um, and then like rough time has, uh, it's not really like a time synchronization protocol because it only gives you basically a range of time. So it can be at most uh, within three seconds because of leap seconds. Uh, 
but it, it's a really nice addition to all the others because usually for the really security sp uh, specific focus, as I said, it's usually fine if it's within minutes. So if rough time tells you your time is somewhere in this 30 second interval, you can make something of it. And then you can still use NTP or PTP to get a precise time within that window for your science experiment, for example. Um, there's also rate time, which I learned around recently by uh, Christian. A uh, draft uh, which is more suited for applications where you don't have a continuous network connection, but instead you rely on like, oh, I've seen this timestamp before, so it must now be after this timestamp, which is a nice trick, uh, but also doesn't really synchronize your clock. Instead, it gives you also basically an interval or a one sided open interval, I guess. Uh, yeah, so we're going to look at NTP and PTP today, and they should be fine. Uh, NTP is a really, really old protocol. It's like RFC 778 in, the in 1981 standardized the first version, so it's one of the first applications to run across the Atlantic as well. Like it's, it's really, really old. Uh, right now we're at version 4 of NTP and version 5 is currently in a draft at IETF. Um, uh, some basic facts about it runs on UDP port 123, which is like Okay, somebody came up with that and took that name. I'm a bit jealous that they got it. Um, it's usually 48 bytes and most or a lot of firewalls expect you that it's always 48 bytes, which is not quite correct, but there were quite some uh, amplification attacks over UDP with it, which then caused a lot of firewall windows to just, whenever there's a UDP packet on port 123, they only accept packets of exactly 48 bytes and nothing else which is a bit of a problem. I heard it's better if you use IPv6 because apparently those bad rules didn't make it over to IPv6 firewalls applications, so just use IPv6 anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, NTP specifies multiple modes of operation, so there's a mode where like multiple devices on a network can agree on the same time and there's modes of client server and it's usually recommended to only use the client server uh, code because all the other modes had a bit of like not problems. Uh, yeah, there were there were some amplification attacks possible with it, and so generally you use client and server applications for NTP now. Um, usually it doesn't have any authentication, so you just send the 48 bytes with like, hey, please send me the current time, and somebody responds with like, sure, here's the current time. It's 1970s now. Um, so that works if you don't rely too heavily on your time, but it's like really, really easy to attack this. Um, there's later a bit, bit of a story about like we can make that better and there's already a way to do it. Um, I saw, like I myself never developed anything in Riot apart from the workshop yesterday, but I looked a bit in the documentation and I saw there's an SNTP client. So SNTP is the simple network time protocol. Um, and that is basically NTP, but you only use the wire format and not also the whole uh, algorithm specification. Um, this is really fine if you just want to get a, a rough idea of time. You just do one request to one server, you get back a time and you assume that time is now. That's fine. Uh, but the full NTP usually requires you to have multiple servers you talk to and then check if those measurements make sense, agree with each other, and so on. And NTP v5, actually, the discussion is currently to remove the specification of the specific algorithm, since also like newer impl implementations don't implement the old specified algorithm, but instead more modern versions of it. So for NTP v5, we might see that the spec gets quite a bit easier because it only specifies the wire format and how you should interact with clients and servers. Um, oh yeah. SNTP. SNTP is, as I said, fine for like IoT applications. If you want to synchron synchronize your oven clock, okay, it's fine. At least the oven and the microwave should be spoofed by the same attacker and get the same time. I'm, I'm fine with that. That's, that's okay. Um, how does you, do you now measure time with NTP? It, it's basically really simple. You send a packet to the server, you note down the exact point in time when you send it, the server receives the packet, notes down when it received that packet, and then the server sends you back the time point where it sent the response, 
and you uh, write down when you received the packet. And with these four timestamps, you can calculate A, what is the time offset between my clock and the service clock, and B, how long did the packet take from A to B. Uh, this works awesome as long as the link is synchronous. So the packet from the client to the server takes exactly the same time as from the server to the client, then everything is fine. In practice, that's not always the case, so we need to do some measurements of like how much a delay is there, then estimate from that what could be the asymmetry of the path. Um, but it's usually fine. You get With NTP, you get into a few milliseconds of accuracy between uh, client and server. That's fine. Um, how do you now get the time? Like, I'm a device, I don't know anything yet uh, about time, so, so I ask some server. Uh, or maybe I just ask two servers because like I'm, I'm then maybe I'm more sure that they actually agree on the right time or the one doesn't have a really weird link where the packet to the server goes via satellite and comes back via fiber or something where it's like hugely asymmetric. Uh, how do those two servers now know where they actually like how late it is? Well, usually they just ask a server. Uh, which uh, makes a bit of a problem because like that server doesn't know anything so it has to rely on some external source of time and practice that's either GNSS as I told before like GPS or Galileo or DCF 77 or any other way of knowing the time. If you're really fancy you just buy an atomic clock and put it in your like uh, basement and then ask that one like uh, the PTB does in Germany. Uh, I, I think they're not in the basement but uh, so, so you have some sort of, of actual time and agreeing on that time, like how all clocks on the world agree on a time is a whole different story of labs sending timestamps to each other, comparing clocks and then correcting for it. Fun. Uh, so what this forms is basically like a tree, like you have all the nodes at the bottom that talk to what is here called stratum 2. Uh, servers which know the time from a stratum 1 server which knows it from the stratum 0 server. Um, so basically the, the, the time, uh, the actual time information travels down this tree and it gets worse over, t uh, over like how far you go but it's fine usually for most applications. Uh, you can even have like stratum like each of these layers are called a stratum. So whenever you look at NTP packets you will also see stratum 1, stratum 2, stratum 3. If it's invalid, it's stratum zero. Um, those, like basically, a, a stratum n minus one server talks to a stratum n minus two server uh, and forms like this relationship. You can have connections between stratum servers on the same level, but then you need to make sure that you don't have any timing loops because otherwise, your time synchronization can actually start to oscillate because uh, the, you have a system that just connected to itself and has a feedback loop. Um, Timestamps representation in uh, NTP is also quite interesting. They start at 1900 or 1st of January 1900. They have 32 bits for seconds and then 32 fractional bits. So it's basically a fixed point, uh, fixed point uh, value with uh, 32 fractional bits, 32 normal bits. Um, so today it's, or like when the talk should have started was EA856638. Um, I don't know if anybody can already see the problem. The E at the front might indicate it. it luckily, it's signed, so we're fine until 2036 when this will roll over. Um, this is also fine because, as everybody knows, like this will roll over in 2036. So all, all implementations surely implemented that time can never jump backwards. So it cannot be. Uh, 1900 again, but it must actually be one second after 30, uh, 2036. Um, I'm, if you operate any big network infrastructure, I would uh, suggest taking a week off during this time uh, because uh, I, I'm sure there's at least one implementation which didn't make this correctly. Uh, NTP version 5 actually now has an ex extra field for the error which should give us, I think, 20,000 years until hopefully somebody makes a new version and has a bigger field. Uh, although the version field only has three bits, so we only have so many more uh, guesses until we have to resort to other means. Um, yeah, so watch out for this. 
it, it should be fine, but especially implementations of like SNTP IoT devices might not get this because they usually just take the time from the server and it's way easier to just add that to like a constant to get to 90, like to get Unix time out of it. Um, I said it's all like super unencrypted, super you have no idea of like who you're actually talking to. So ITF came up with uh, network time security in RFC 8915. Relatively new, only five years, old, four years old. And there's already three implementations of it. Of course, this is the best implementation because I wrote part of it. Um, but also Crony supports it. Uh, NTPSec, which is a fork of the original NTPD, also supports it. So you, if you have NTP running somewhere, most likely uh, your client supports it, except for if you're on Ubuntu and use systemd timesyncd, which does not support it yet. Uh, but I know somebody is working on support for that. So I, I hope that you're soon we also should see NTS there. Uh, NTS is was a bit of a, f yeah, needs to make a trade off between like you want quick, uh, quick packets, uh, you shouldn't be too large, you also want just one packet in one direction each, so you get nice timing properties. So they split up the protocol in two parts. There's a key establishment phase in NTSKE, which uses TLS to actually ex exchange some cookies with the server and uh, establish a set of keys. And then in, for the actual time packets, you have an extension field which uses these keys to encrypt fields and also sign the whole message. Um, as, I, as I said before, TLS is a wonderful application for time synchronization because you want to know how late it is, so verify certificates. So this has a bit of a bootstrapping problem usually, um, which you can solve by just asking many servers and hoping that not five uh, private keys were compromised in the meantime. Um, and are all valid for the same time frame. Uh, basically, you make a world where all the NTPs, uh, NT, uh, all the TLS servers were nice to you. Make a time from that and check if that is uh, compatible with all the different validity, validity, validity chain, uh, ranges of the TLS certificates. Um, What's also cool about like this being two steps is, in theory, you could do like you could get the cookies and keys. Uh, from a other server, so if you have like uh, some sort of server which can easily do TLS and you have a constraint device where you really don't want to also do TLS, uh, then you could have a server which gener uh, does the key establishment for you and just gives you the keys and the cookies. But of course then you have to trust that server which is annoying, but at least better than you have to trust your network or suddenly you need a bigger flash chip maybe. Um, so uh, NTS is here, please please use it, it's, it's nice. Uh, if you want to use it, you can also use NTP DRS, uh, it's a modern implementation of NTP written in Rust completely, it's MIT licensed, so freely available. Uh, there is NTS support, there's also support for the NTP version 5 draft if you enable a feature flag. Um, it's actually used by Let's Encrypt now for their timing needs. And what I said before, with the algorithm being specified in the RFC, uh, we didn't do that. We implemented a more modern time synchronization approach based on Kaiman filters. There's a whole lot of uh, interesting research around like how you actually can synchronize clocks or figure out how noisy your channel is. It's really cool. And it just works. Um, so. You want to have more precision because like, I don't know, you have your uh, particle accelerator in your backyard and really want to be, have, have the good time there. Then you can use the precision time protocol which is uh, implemented in IEEE 1588 or specified in IEEE 1588. Um, and it does some tricks, mainly it do, does hardware time stamping for basically everything. So usually when you send a packet, uh, your operating system can record the current time, but you can also have your network card actually get the precise time at which the first bit left the file interface. And in PTP, that's done for sending and receiving packets. And it's also done in the switches between. So, as you know, a switch basically is also just a computer which takes the packet and then maybe checks the COC is still valid and then passes it on to the other port to send on. Uh, 
So that takes time. And so PTP has a correction field where you basically, on the fly, while you're receiving the packet, you measure the speci specific incoming time. When you start sending out the first bits, you record the starting time of that. And then on the fly, you change the right bits in the field, uh, in the packet, while it leaves your interface, and then you have uh, corrected, but then you have a field which tells you, okay, you might have received it now, but actually in between all the routers and stuff took like five milliseconds to actually process your packet and forward it on and so on. Um, which also means you need special hardware, uh, which mainly in, in the sense of like switches and so on, uh, or in network cards. Luckily, most microcontrollers that I saw, specifically the STM32 Ethernet peripherals, have support for this time stamping. So you can just get the timestamp from there and uh, basically move on. Uh, luckily, they also have 48 bits for seconds, so they should hold on a bit longer for uh, until it rolls over. And 32 bits for nanoseconds. So where NTP uses a fixed point integer, PTP uses a second field and a nanosecond field, and you have to recalculate what it means and afterwards. Uh, yeah, and this path correction is basically the, the all every device on the way actually updates your timestamp of of, every, uh, of how long the packet took. That can even be done between router uh, between switches. So switches can beforehand calculate how long the time between them is and correct for this time as well. Um, yeah, the the thing with PTP is like it's a really really thick spec where it, like usually an RFC is like okay I can read this in a day and it's be, it'll be fine. Uh, the PTP spec is like, uh, I don't know how many pages, it's really thick. And it allows you to basically modify almost everything in the protocol, so they have like profiles for different applications to agree on stuff. Um, some developments in the PTP area, uh, area is, uh, as I said, CERN has a big uh, particle accelerator, they want precise time, and they couldn't buy that off the shelf, so they started developing uh, open source hardware and software to b get better time synchronization in a project called White Rabbit, uh, where they not only use the time stamping feature, but they also use the carrier wave of the Ethernet uh, format itself to also like get like when actually did this bit start and synchronize clock uh, synchronize clocks based on that. It's like a really really cool project. Luckily, like almost everything CERN does is like open hardware, open software, so you can look into it. The problem is it's, the hardware is still expensive because you need like a big FPGA and yeah. But at least you can look at it. You can look at the very lot code they wrote to, to make all that work. Um, there is also, uh, <laughs> PTP is usually not uh, s secured in any way. There is a current IETF draft on like getting NTS to work for PTP with a lot of uh, discussions around that. Um, the, yeah, usually with PTP, people just assume it's on a trusted network uh, because, like, you you always have the attack vector of delaying packets. So you could, I could delay one packet in one direction, and uh, suddenly the path would be highly asymmetric, even though the device doesn't expect it. So there's always this problem of like, if you physically attack the network, you can already do harm. Uh, that's why most most of them just operate with like, okay, this network is really safe, like nobody can touch it, so it should all be fine. Um, I also looked at Riot uh, quickly for uh, APIs there, and there is an, uh, a clock API, so you can get timestamps, and I think you can set the clock in a PTP specific manner. So, uh, but I didn't find any code for actual PTP implementation. Um, oh yeah, the. The problem with PTP is that the protocol stack or the, the software stack you need to have gets quite complicated because now you need to talk to the specific network card to get out, figure out the send and receive timestamps. You need to like set the clock in the network card and um, all of that jazz. Uh, you also need to, oh yeah, basically two parts. You need to set the clock in the right way because that clock might not be your normal system clock, but the clock might run on the network card, which you then might want to synchronize between the network card and your system clock. Uh, so you need to have ABI APIs for that, and you need to have an API for timestamping packets. Uh, on top of that, there's the BMCA, the Best Master Clock Algorithm, which is a great acronym, which determines like which clock should you actually use. Like you have a network and there's 100 devices, and every device of those has a clock. 
Some of them might have an uplink to GPS satellite, some of them might have a really good oscillator and you need to decide uh, who should I actually now listen to for the current time and the BMCA figures all that out with a lot of parameters around which oscillator is used, what priority does this device have, what long term stuff does it have, how was this clock set including the nice uh, category for like this clock was sent by, set by a human in a manual way which I'm I, I like that. The idea of somebody walking around with a clock and being like, okay, now this clock, we need to synchronize to this, okay, fine. Um, uh, there's a few implementations of it. A lot of it is, a lot of implementations are closed source because this is like proprietary stuff. In a lot of cases, like you also need to buy the IEEE spec, so on. Eh. Uh, but there's Linux PTP, which is quite widely used and supports Linux and there's StatTime which is the implementation I partially worked on uh, in Rust and as I said in, in Riot there's already a HAL for the clock. I didn't see one for network timestamping and I didn't see any, uh, any PTP implementation but if you know let me know I, I would be interested. Um, so StatTime. StatTime is two things. It's a binary that you can run on your Linux machine and it will synchronize your clock like Linux PTP would. But it's also a library so you can integrate it into your applications. It's a completely sans IO library and it doesn't need the Rust standard library so you can basically run it anywhere where you can uh, compile Rust code to. So a lot of targets, everything LLVM supports. Um, and the API is also really nice because it's usually uh, please tell me if you have a packet for me of one of the, my timers expired and if you do that it gives you back a list of please send this packet out over the network and record its timestamp or please set this timer to this specific time and wake me once it's done. So it's, uh, it really lends itself to be integrated into other applications without needing to have any hell or anything in between. Uh, it also uses the same Kaiman filter that we uh, saw before which uh, in my few experiments was really nice because before we had like an averaging filter so that said like okay the clock over there said it's uh, 2024, my clock says it's 1970, okay let's see it's somewhere in the middle. So you would have this like okay yeah jump in the right direction but please get me to the right time immediately and the Kaiman filter did that. It was like plug in and oh chuck, locks suddenly came in on the right time. Super nice. And we have an application or an example running on STM32 uh, based on the STM32 ETH Rust crate. But as I said, the, the API is really simple and I think it lends, even lends itself to be used from C because uh, the, the, it's so simple. Just here's a packet or here's a timestamp or here's your timer expired and you get back a list. Um, yeah. Stuff I didn't cover here which is hugely fun if you do ever any kinds of timing work. Uh, starting from time zones which usually the suggestion is just use UTC, everything will be fine until you encounter leap seconds when suddenly actually seconds happen twice maybe sometimes or so far we were already l always lucky I think we always jump in one direction. Now there might be a leap second which jumps in the other direction and we don't know if all software supports that. Uh, there's also different like strategies to deal with that. Basically Google I think does leap smearing so you spread out the one second difference over 24 hours and there's different standards on how to do that so nobody really agrees. Uh, whatever. Uh, so instead I would suggest just use Thai which is uh, Time Atomique International. I, I, my French is super bad but it's uh, Atomic Climb which is uh, basically UTC but we never did leap seconds so it's I think 17 seconds off or it's 24 by now from, uh, from UTC but this will never move. It, it will always like chuck along in one second even though if the earth spins faster or slower it's, it's fine. Um, there, if you want to have the real uh, astronomical time you want UT1 which is the actual precise time like the noon in Greenwich on a sunny day, I don't know how they specify that precisely but if you want to look at stars you need UT1. Uh, <laughs> and there was also the fun part where GPS actually thought we're just going to do UTC, it's fine and then they figured out oh UTC has leap seconds so uh, they are now at UTC but without the leap seconds after GPS started 
So the, uh, really weird stuff is then GLONASS, which is not UTC, no, it's Moscow time, <laughs> including leap seconds. So the, um, yeah, don't, just don't. Uh, also, I'm not a physicist. I'm not going to talk about reference frame and stuff can't actually happen at the same time. Uh, that, that's over my pay grade. I, yeah. And I hope at the end of, if you do enough with time, you get to Dix XKTD where it's like, oh, what's, if you have time T1 and time T2, how much time was there between? Like I'm, I'm roughly in this department of like nobody can tell and you shouldn't ask please. Like most of the time it's fine. Uh, what should you take home from this? Uh, please synchronize your oven clocks in a good way. Uh, it's important for a lot of stuff and also if you operate any servers, please use NTS instead of normal NTP. There's a lot of uh, nice articles around from NetNot and from other operators which tell you here's the servers you can use, uh, here's the clients you can use, here's how you set it up. So please, please use that. Yeah, that's it from my place. Thanks for this nice presentation, almost on time. Um, are there any questions? Hey, uh, thanks for thanks for this talk coming here. Um, well, if I did what you suggested about uh, the key exchange for NTS and then using the key material, how long can I use that key material? I know it's kind of a question about time again, but uh, I think it's not really. Um it's not specified, the keys should never expire because the server doesn't need to keep the keys but they are encoded in the cookies. So the server doesn't have states so they shouldn't expire but of course in theory the server might not be able to decode the cookies anymore. But the nice thing about those cookies is what you usually do, you send the cookie along with your request and you get back two new cookies uh, which you can then store and basically update over time. Um, that's also because like if you have packet loss then suddenly your cookie is gone and then at some point you run out of cookies. I think the key exchange gives you eight cookies to start with and then from there on you just keep on updating through normal packets. Um, I have one uh, comment on the, on, uh, you mentioned the DLS certificates and I've, uh, I've had many discussions with people where the thought that the use of certificates in DLS is somehow special and if they use certificates uh, in a different protocol then suddenly all their problems go away. Uh, I've had yeah. that uh, numerous times and it always puzzles me and I, I have to say it. Uh, yeah. Sort of, uh, and the issue is the time aspects, they're obviously with the, the issue with the certificate rather than with yeah. DLS. Uh, um, However, in this case, the bootstrapping statement I think is overrated. Uh, the bootstrapping problem is overrated because for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is in TLS you don't need to use certificates if you don't want. Uh, okay. That's the, f the first one. The second one is specifically in this use case, uh, this use case is different from the web BKI use of certificates uh, where you randomly talk to random servers on the internet as you are browsing the web. And, and so you can actually identify servers and basically nail them down. You need to sort of rely on some form of uh, sort of mechanism to um, do the revocation. Uh, but that would be a problem with any solution you come up with. Uh, yeah. Yeah, as I said, it's like it's a theoretical problem. So in theory, there might be like the five servers you talk to, five of them might have been compromised all at the same time and now they yeah. can pretend that it's that time where they were compromised and that's fine. Yeah. Um, but it, in practice, it's fine. Uh, it's only annoying for like devices where you don't have any RTC or any permanent storage yeah. so on. Uh, but in practice, yeah, it's not a big issue. Yeah. That's why I would generally recommend use NTS, please. Okay, any other questions? Any more questions? So, um, I, I was wondering if it would make sense to combine such a network time synchronization mechanism with uh, capabilities on your platform to uh, calibrate the oscillator itself. Yeah. Uh, is that something that makes sense or is yeah. it okay to just do it in software and add some? 
offset. No, that, that's what's usually done. Like uh, our like the PTP implementation does that. It basically gives you like please tune your oscillator. Like it can tell you like please offset your oscillator now by 30 years because 1970 passed. It can also tell you please uh, slow down your oscillator by 5 ppm and, and that's also, also what it does. Uh, it has the really cool effect if you actually compare two boards with like pulse per second output and you touch one of them with like your finger on the oscillator, you can see it speeding up. Like you can see suddenly that the, it goes from like a 100 nanosecond offset off to like 500 nanoseconds. Uh, really interesting to see that actually physics is involved with this. Okay, cool, thanks. Very, very interesting presentation. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, maybe just for our own culture or my, uh, what, what's the most vicious, um, let's say, uh, attack or exploit of, of vulnerabilities of timing systems that you've heard of that, uh, that you can tell about? Um, that I, I'd be interested, maybe you, uh, with your extended experience, you know some stuff that will make us laugh or... <laughs> yeah, uh, my, my colleague David actually built a little application which just spoofed all the NTP packets in our Wi-Fi for some time just to see like who actually uses NTS because of course like if we implemented NTS everybody should use it at the office and people who don't deserve to live in 1970 back again. <laughs> uh, so that, that's really straightforward. If you are in the middle you can just uh, spoof a response, but you can even, if you don't sit in the middle, if you're just on the same network, you can just broadcast out responses for different request timestamps, basically. Um, and by that, the device usually takes the first response it, uh, it gets, because otherwise it, like, it can't tell, like, how long should I wait before, like, the actual response comes in. Uh, so that's, for NTP, that's the really, really simple uh, attack. Also, most vicious because, like, well, fun, David. Now I, uh, I need to set my uh, clock again, or now I need to like I can't log into anything because DLS says those certificates aren't valid yet. Um, I worked on a on a device management specification called Lightweight MTM. In there, we also had the question of like, what should we do about time synchronization? And the, uh, we came up with the idea that for most of those uh, constrained IoT use cases, we actually don't want to use a separate uh, protocol, but instead we want to um, incorporate the, the time as a configuration parameter during the setup, doing the whole bootstrapping. Yeah. So when the device, at that time, you can't rely on whatever is in the certificate anyway, uh, like in, in terms of time, yeah. uh, because ideally you want to have those manufacturer provided certificate to have infinite lifetime. They actually mm -hmm. yep. in, per, burnt into ROM, they are not going to yep. change anyway. Um, and then you, you do the dance and then so you uh, provide that uh, configuration information. Have you seen that in other cases? Or like uh, the, uh, doing the, f the same approach or did they just fall back sort of like sequence one protocol after the other? Uh, you, you all, or most implementations I've seen only implement either NTP or PTP as a client. Mm. So there's usually okay. not a using multiple ways. Okay. Um, what I definitely have seen is that there's usually, you, when you build a software, you burn down the current time, mm -hmm. so you know it's never before that time. Okay. That's a common approach. Mm -hmm. Basically, I might compile my software today, it will never accept a timestamp that was uh, a week ago, which at least gives you some way of like ratcheting to, to more backward incompatible stuff. Yeah. Okay, so for the sake of time, no pun intended, um, let's uh, shut the discussion here and take it offline if there are any other questions. Let's thank uh, Tamar again and um, thank you.